Kay and Valeria, you've come to me expressing your desire to be united by the ties of Christian marriage. And I'd like to remind you and your family and friends of the significance of the marriage relationship. The first marriage ceremony was conducted by no less a dignitary than God the Father himself in the Garden of Eden. The scripture tells us in the book of Genesis chapter 2, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up his place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. We see that marriage, according to the Bible, is a God-ordained union between one man and one woman for procreation, completion, and a depiction of the covenant relationship that exists between Jesus Christ and his body, the church. Jesus, the Son of God, performed his first miracle at a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee as if to say, this is my stamp of approval on what is undoubtedly the most important of all human relationships, the relationship between a man and woman and the bond of marriage. And the lengthiest discussion of the subject of marriage found in Scripture, written by the Apostle Paul, begins in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blame. Blame. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Love your wife as Christ loved the church and lay down his life for the church. Now I would imagine most of us here understand what he meant. He was speaking of the time when Christ gave his life for his bride, the church. He was crucified on the cross in order to pay the penalty of his bride's sin in order that he could have her as his wife. And we think about the love of Christ, and what we do know about the love of Christ is it is indeed an unconditional kind of love. 
Pause with me just a moment and think about what happened to Jesus in the run-up to the cross and during the crucifixion itself. The people who hated, humiliated, and hurt Jesus were the very people that He interceded for in prayer from the cross. His first prayer, perhaps you remember, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. If ever there is a picture of unconditional love, that is the epitome of such a picture. And it describes for us very graphically the kind of unconditional love that Jesus has for us. While we were yet sinners, the Bible says, Christ died for us when we were His enemies because of our rebellion in our hearts against Him by preferring our own way to Him. He found us as enemies, but He embraced us and gave Himself for us. In the great chapter on love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, among other things, the Apostle Paul writes these words. Love keeps no record of wrongs. That's amazing, isn't it? I would dare say there's probably not a person present today with the exception of maybe the youngest children present who do not know what it's like to hold a grudge against someone who has mistreated you or offended you in some way. May it be ever so slight. But think about this, how this would impact all of our marriages if Enrique and I and all the husbands present were to make this a motto in their lives. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Enrique Valetti is a beautiful person. On the outside, we see that today with our eyes. But we know she's even more beautiful on the inside. But she's not perfect. There are going to be days when she offends you. And what is Christ calling you to do? To die to your own pride and lay down your life for your wife. There's great hope for your marriage if you do that. Believe me. And the next thing we would make note of regarding the love of Jesus, not only is it unconditional, but it's also unselfish. Jesus says this about himself on the eve of his destruction. He said, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Valetti is your friend. She's more than that, but she is indeed your friend. And to be like Jesus, you have to be willing to die for her. Now, there are many men in the room who in a moment of great danger to your spouse, you would gladly give your life. It would be a, a heroic measure to do that. You would go out in a blaze of glory. But many times, in fact, every day, I would dare say, Enrique, in this marriage, this beginning of the day, the Lord will call on you to lay down your life for your wife, to love her with His love, a thoroughly unselfish love. John Stott has said about this love that's uniquely Christian, that it is the sacrifice of self on behalf of undeserving others. Sometimes this beautiful woman may not deserve your love because of her attitude towards you. I'm going to get to him. Okay, you, yeah. He's getting beat up a little bit here. Does that this afternoon? But you always ask the Lord Jesus to give you his love for this woman as your friend and as your lover. Both are very important to a successful relationship. The Bible also says in 1 Corinthians 13, not only does it say, as we saw, love keeps no record of wrongs, but listen carefully, men. Love does not insist on its own way. Now, I dare say this would really change the climate of every marriage in this room. And I'm not saying that I know what's going on in your marriage, but every marriage could 
standing up great, a little bit, right? <laughs> All of us could, and our wives would vouch for that, I'm sure. But if we were to say in the morning, every morning, Enrique, when we awake, Lord, I don't want to insist on my own way today. I want to do what you want. And that will have an incredible bearing on the relationship that you and Valeria are beginning today. A third characteristic of the love of Jesus, unconditional, unselfish, but it's also understanding. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, that husbands are to live with their wives in an understanding way. Now, the reality is, ladies, and you don't need me to tell you this, men just don't get it sometimes. <laughs> we don't fully understand you. And we have to work on it. This should be your project. She should be your lifelong research project <laughs> to understand. Not because she's difficult, but she's so multifaceted. And so this is the Lord's call upon your life to think about Jesus. The Bible says in the beginning was the word, speaking of Jesus, and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so what we know is that Jesus became one of us. The scripture says we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize, that means understand our weakness, but one who has been tempted in every way as we have been yet without sin. Jesus became flesh and bone, came out of heaven having lived from eternity in memoriam in order to be one of us so that he could understand us. And this is what the Lord has for you in your marriage. I'm almost finished, Enrique. The last thing I would note, this won't take but a moment. The love of Jesus is never ending. In one of the more poignant moments in the life of Jesus, he is with his most cherished friends, the apostles. They're in a place which came to be known as the upper room. And as he enters the room. He's preparing to celebrate Passover with his friends. It will be the last time he eats a meal with them. For over three years, he shared his life with them. He's laughed with them. He's wept with them. He has cheered them on when he sent them out to learn how to be the kind of person God needed to carry the work on after Jesus was crucified, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. And there was a squabble in that upper room. The squabble had to do with who was going to assume the role of a slave. The slave didn't show up. Someone needed to wash the feet of the apostles. Jesus waited, but there was no response on the part of any of them. And then Jesus took on the form of a slave, the scripture says, and he went from man to man got down on his knees, assumed the position of the slave of every one of those men and expressed his unconditional, unselfish, understanding love for them. In that same passage of the Bible, in John chapter 13, this is what the scripture says about the heart of Jesus. Now listen. He said, having loved them, he loved them from the beginning. He loved them. He loved them until the end. What does that mean? What does the gospel writer mean when he says until the end? I believe it means to the end of the ordeal of his own demise, the crucifixion. How many of these men followed Jesus to the point of his death? None. They all deserted him. A couple followed from a distance, Peter and John, those who were closer to him of the twelve, Judas having already betrayed Jesus and hanged himself. But the good news is, the Bible says once more in 1 Corinthians 13, love never ends. Your love for this woman, God's love through you, must never end. Now, Valeria, this won't take as long. It may be more painful, but it won't take as long. 
where the scripture says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And it says also in the scripture, respect your husband. God knew what he was doing when he gave these kinds of instruction because it says, husbands, love your wives as you love yourself. The thing that we men need most from our wives in the relationship is encouragement. And we want our wives to recognize those things in our lives that really are worth respecting. And the result is our self-esteem will improve. I believe the majority, the vast majority of women want to be adored for who they are, not for what they do, but for who they are. And the good news is that when we love our wives as Christ of the church, our wives will indeed know that they are adored. They are cherished by us more than anything else in this world, except for our relationship to Him through Christ. So the scripture is very clear that wives are to respect their husbands and submit to their husbands. Allow me a quotation or two from one of my heroines of history and a heroine of the faith. Her name is Elizabeth Elliot. I almost said why she's gone out of this world into the next. And this is what she said. She said, to marry usually means to be transplanted. It always means to hand over power. Now that may be a little deceiving, a little yielding in in, in negativity, but it's not to be construed that way. Because this woman was not making this remark in resentment. She was making it from a position of understanding the joy of being married. She was a great woman. She wrote over 40 books in her lifetime. She was a courageous woman. She went with her husband and four other couples to the farthest reaches in the Ecuadorian jungle on the Amazon River, and then one of his tributaries to reach a people group who had never heard the gospel of Christ. And there, her husband and four other men were killed by the very people whom they came to share the gospel with. The wives left, including herself, after that difficulty, but she came back and served the Lord there for years. This is what she says. She was married the third time after having lost her first two husbands, including Jim Elliott, the first man I referred to. This is what she said. On the morning she married, the third time, she wrote this prayer to the Lord. Lord, Father of spirits, lover of souls, my light and my stronghold, thank you. Thank you for the greatest earthly gift, marriage. She loved it, and she learned the imperative of respecting her husband, submitting to her, his leadership rather, as to the Lord, just like the church is. That's the call upon your life. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for this moment, and we're looking forward to your empowering, both Enrique and Valeria, by your Holy Spirit, to love as Christ loved the church and gave himself for the church and to respect and submit as the church is to Jesus. We invite you, Lord, to be at this wedding. I I seem to believe you're already here. I sense your presence because you say, wherever two or three have gathered together in your name, there you are in the midst of them. We thank you for this, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you, Enrique, and Valeria to turn and hold hands with each other. Enrique, I'm going to ask you to say your vows to your bride after me. I, Enrique, I, Enrique, vow to you, Valeria, vow to you, Valeria, my never-ending love, my never-ending love, I promise to be faithful to you. I promise to be faithful to you. As a friend. As a friend. And lover. And lover. I realize. I realize. That it won't always be easy to love. That, that it won't be always easy to love. But with the aid of our Lord. But with the aid of our Lord. I will love you. I will love you. 
in times of prosperity, in times of prosperity, as well as adversity, as well as adversity. Valeria, now I'm going to ask you to repeat the same vows. I, Valeria, I, Valeria, vow to you, Enrique, vow to you, Enrique, my never-ending love, my never-ending love. I promise, I promise to be faithful to you, to be faithful to you, as a friend, as a friend, and lover, and lover. I also realize. I also realize it will not always be easy to love. It will not always be easy to love. But with the aid of our Lord, but with the aid of our Lord, I will love you. I will love you. In times of prosperity. In times of prosperity. As well as adversity. As well as adversity. Yeah. As a tangible token of their love and faithfulness to one another, this couple has chosen to exchange rings. It's no secret that the ring is an unbroken circle that symbolizes two things at least. It speaks of the endlessness of the marriage relationships, a permanent relationship from God's viewpoint. What Jesus says about it is true. What God has joined together, let no one put asunder. And it's also a symbol of exclusiveness. One man, one woman, there's not room for anyone in this relationship except the two who are married. If you'll take this ring and put it on the ring finger of Valeria's left hand, that ring's not coming off, I'm telling you. <laughs> if you'll repeat these vows to Valeria. With this ring, with this ring, I be wed, I be wed. With all my love, with all my love, I thee and thou, I thee and thou. All my worldly goods, all my worldly goods, with thee I share, with thee I share. In the name of God the Father, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, Valeria, if you'll take this ring and place it on the ring finger of Enrique's Enrique's left hand and holding it there, repeat these vows. With this ring, with this ring, I thee wed, be wed. With all my love, with all my love, I thee and thou, I thee and thou. All my worldly goods, all my worldly goods, with thee I share, with thee I share. In the name of God the Father, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit. Amen. How fitting it is that this couple observe communion. Because Jesus said, wherever two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Because they are centering not just this ceremony, but their very lives on the person of Jesus. And he will be the prominent figure in their marriage. They really form a picture of the church in miniature because of the presence of Christ. The Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. This man, this woman, Christ at the center. Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity to have been here this afternoon to watch this couple publicly confess their love for you and allegiance to one another as they embark upon this most important of all human relationships, marriage. Give them much fruit in their lives together much more than they would have experienced had they not been united in marriage. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One final set of vows to be spoken simultaneously. These are found in the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. Entreat me not to leave you or to return from following after you for where you go, for where you go, I will go. I will go. And where you lodge, and where you lodge, I will lodge. I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Your people will be my people. And your God, my God. And your God, my God. Enrique, Enrique rather, and Valeria, by the power vested in me as a servant of the state of Texas and a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss your bride. Before I spoke
Felt no worse. You paid it all. 